We are back for another edition of the MMA Report Podcast. Of course, I am Jason Foy. That is my colleague, Daniel Galvan. Daniel, uh, the MMA world is buzzing. And Dana White went Dana White, you know. Francis Ngannou makes his big news, and UFC says, oh, let's just start making all these fight announcements. Also, they have announced today they're going to Australia later this year for a UFC pay-per-view. And, of course, you read the press release, you kind of figure out, yeah, basically uh, Australia's paying the UFC a ton of money, so they're going to bring a big fight card there. But before we get into Francis Ngannou, because that's going to be really our main topic here this week here on the podcast, is... The McGregor Forever documentary dropped today on Netflix. I watched the first episode, a, a tremendous first episode. And, you know, like like my takeaways from the episode, Daniel, and I know you've just watched a little bit of the episode, is, is I feel like we're getting a, we're seeing a different version of Conor McGregor. But like my two biggest takeaways from what I saw in, in episode one was about his rivalry with Habib Nurmagomedov is the behind the scenes footage of Connor in the back after the loss. And even going back in and watching this episode, I kind of forgot about how the fight really went. I mean, you, you forget about how Beeb had rocked Connor. What was in, I want to say it was in the second round. He rocked him off, ultimately finished him in the fourth round. Connor had his moments in, in the matchup as well, but you see the raw emotion of Connor McGregor after this fight. And then there's a point where Dana is talking to him and Dana's like, Hey, if you need anything, let me, no, Dana walks out, and then you see Connor's son right run right up to him, and you see the emotion that Connor had. And then, of course, we get to see that his community service for the Dolly incident was in a part of cleaning a church. And I know me and you have have talked about you know MMA documentaries we want to see. If I didn't have other things to do, I would have been to watch the entire series earlier today. But uh, I will say, as a, a mixed martial arts fan, I'm really intrigued to see what this whole documentary is because I was really blown away with episode one. Okay, I've only seen the first 10 minutes because I, I woke up this morning, watched a little bit, then I went straight to work and... My job, it's fast and furious. I didn't really have any downtime. I, I got to say, I really enjoyed the first 10 minutes. And the people behind it, Religion of Sport, I believe, is the name of the company. That's Deepak Chopra. They do a really good job with these like athlete-produced documentaries, right? I believe they did the Tom Brady documentary. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but I believe they did do that one. And I do know they have their hands in a couple of other uh, interesting pots. Like they're doing a G League documentary with Amazon they're working on. And they do a good job of telling the story. But obviously the one caveat with these type of documentaries, Jason, is I would doubt that we're going to get into some of the really dirty stuff, right? Yeah. The the crimes, some of the other crimes that Connor has been accused of. The things that are really like as an MMA fan make me question whether or not I should be thinking about Conor McGregor as a fighter. When you look at some of the more serious crimes he's been accused of. So that I assume is not covered in episode two, three or four, and it might be covered. I will report back to you next week. Cause I will try and watch everything by next week, but I must say so far I'm really into it and I'm really into learning about a new side of Connor and it appears as though we're going to get seen Connor with the, when the spotlight isn't completely on him. With that being said, from what I saw, the man was in the hospital bed fresh off breaking his ankle and he was already cutting a promo from the hospital bed, ready to promote his next fight. Yeah, you know, there is a, a part in the first episode where he's training for the Habib fight. And I'm not, I'm not giving anything away majorly here, but he injures his toe in a, in a training session. And basically, it's a dislocated toe. Um, if you're, I don't know, maybe if you're a little queasy, maybe you wouldn't want to watch this part as they're um, putting the toe back in place. Oh, that sounds gross. And, and, you, and you just see Connor's face reaction. And then after they do it, he's like, oh, that wasn't that bad. I'm like, no, bro, I saw your face. You were in riveting pain. Yeah, that that sounds awful. And I am squeamish. I'm not looking forward to it. I did see a scene where they were doing a gender reveal uh, yeah. for Connor's second child. And there was like one person who was blurred out. And I'm like, who's that? that. Who's that? Who's that one person that is just ruining the beautiful shot for everyone? And how does Connor not be like, hey, 
let us show your damn face because it looks stupid that we have a blur here. I don't know if that person is like an undercover FBI agent that's a part of Connor's inner circle. But my other thought watching this thing was, damn, Connor's son might be a world champion fighter one day. I mean, I saw this little baby hanging by some Olympic rings. Yeah. I can't even do that. I'm a full grown man. Yeah, I, I did see that. You know, but I, I think that I, I my my perception of this documentary is about rehabbing his image. You know, like what you just mentioned, every, everything has happened here. I was actually kind of surprised that maybe today wasn't the day that we got the Conor McGregor fight announcement of when his matchup against Michael Chandler is going to happen. Because the, the thing that's interesting to me, and I don't know if it was last week or the week before when Dana White got asked about it, he just basically just did answer the question. You know, previously he's talked about, you know, when people have asked the question about USADA and Conor McGregor, he goes, well, go talk to Jeff Nowitzki. I'm like, well, you're the UFC president. You should know the answer to these questions. Uh, but it, it is kind of interesting. The fact that the ultimate fire does debut here in what, two weeks from now. And we, we still don't know this, when this fight's going to take place, what weight class is going to take place at. Um, uh, clearly, it'll be Conor McGregor. Whatever weight class Conor McGregor wants it in, it, it's going to be in. But, you know, it, it's still, I mean, look, it's I'm fascinated to see it. But obviously, the big news of the week was uh, uh, the news we all knew was coming. I think we all kind of, you know, it was very clear where Francis Ngannou was going to end up in terms of mixed martial arts competition. And uh, it gets announced on, uh, what was it, Tuesday morning. I think I got the press release at Lisa, like 6.01 a.m. East Coast time that he had signed a, a I, I, forget, I think the, the press release says something like a historic, what you know, you know, MMA contract. But uh, Bloody Elbow, and by the way, John National or Bloody Elbow has done a great job. And it's kind of interesting, some of these figures. And, you know, one of the things is, is I mean, look, Francis got the bag. There ain't no doubt about that. Francis got the bag. Kudos to him getting the bag. And so this was the reporting from John Nash. It's only for two or three fights. Guarantees a high seven-figure purse for each fight. A split of the event, net profits. I think that's that's the key word in that, net profits. Because if the event doesn't make money, well, then you're not getting extra money. A signing bonus or salary to serve as a, a brand ambassador for the PFL, the rights to have his own sponsors in the cage, non-exclusive with regards to boxing, no champion's clause or other extensions, a minimum salary possibly as high as $1 million for his opponent, apparently, and, and Ghana comes out say as high as $2 million. I've already seen Ben Rothel like, I'm here, I'm here. Um, you know, and I will tell you the one tweet that I got in response to this and I sent it to you. And to me, it was a spot on tweet. It was, uh, from Chris, who's been a long time follower of mine. And he tweeted me, he goes, yeah, I mean, he shouldn't care. He got paid, but it's telling that every single reaction, everyone is happy about his bag. Not a single one is like, yeah, I can't wait for all the fights. We can see him with the next year in the PFL. They need a big UFC name, but who? And I thought that was a spot on tweet because that was the general reaction that we saw on social media yesterday was, hey, man, glad this guy got the bag. And, you know, I tweeted that my initial thoughts were, look, happy to see a fighter get the bag. But time is going to tell what kind of matchup the PFL can put together. Now, they've got some time here because he's not going to make his PFL debut till 2024. But, you know, Don Davis had initially mentioned about him fighting the winner of this se this season's heavyweight tournament. And, Daniel, you look at these names in this heavyweight tournament, you just don't exactly sit back and go, oh, damn, can't wait to see who that might be. Yeah, you really don't. Granted, like half the PFL field did get taken out by a drug test, so maybe there'll be some new names that are introduced in the tournament. Uh, the heavyweight tournament field, not a real interesting name. The most interesting name is Maurice Green because you can tell the story that he's a training partner of John Jones, and if he goes undefeated, pieces together some nice wins, there's a story. The other thing is, if you're a UFC heavyweight and you can get out of your deal before 2024, Two million dollar payday sounds pretty interesting. That is more money than you will make in any UFC fight, as long as you're not a champion, really. So if you're you if you're Stipe Miocic, <laughs> and and you can fight out your deal and make a two million payday in the PFL by 2024, maybe that's a move you do make. 
So it may be too early to say we won't get an interesting Francis fight if he doesn't fight until 2024. As the as the deck lays out now and you look at the roster of PFL, they don't have a single fighter that I'm interested in seeing Francis fight. But we have a long time until that happens. And again, there is that big payday for whoever steps in the cage against Francis. So we might get a relevant fight. When we're backtracking and we're looking at the bag, and let's analyze the bag, let's analyze the hypothetical bank account. Do you believe that at the end of 2024, Francis will have more money in his bank account than if then if he had signed with the UFC, re-signed with the UFC? Would he have more money in his bank account had he done what he did today, yesterday or had he signed with the UFC? Did they make that clear? Over the next two years, is he going to make more money right now in his current deal with the PFL, which allows him to box, or do you think he would have made more money had he signed with the UFC, took a John Jones fight, and had a couple other fights? I think it's more likely making more money in the PFL because I think he would lose to John Jones. And then that that money would drastically change. You know, I mean, look, you got to give the PFL credit. I mean, you, you talk about you know, swinging for the fences here. This is them swinging for the fences. And I don't know how many people have brought at this point, but the one thing that I find interesting, when you talk about the two biggest signings in PFL history, Francis Ngannou clearly has to be number one. But prior to that, it would have been the re-signing of Kayla Harrison. And Kayla's contract is up at the end of this year, and they do not have matching rights. So you're talking about the two biggest contracts that the PFL has signed that there is no matching rights in either one of those deals. That to me is you talk about something we have not seen in mixed martial arts, whether we're talking about the UFC or Bellator or any other promoter, major promoter is to sit there, make a notable free agent signing and saying, yeah, we're going to waive our right to have some type of matching clause when your contract expires. Yeah. And that's good for the fighters. That's really good for the fighters, and that's what happens when you have multiple options. Hopefully, that works in the long run for the fighters, and the PFL can stay afloat, Bellator can stay afloat, because those matching rights deal that they had with Kayla in the previous contract, I mean, that really screwed over Kayla Harrison, I think. Um, so that's great for the fighters, and I, and I think that's a thing that should continue to happen. But yes, the PFL's between a rock and a hard place. I will say I would bump Kayla's signing to number three. I think Jake Paul is a bigger signing than Kayla. I think he means more for pay-per-view than Kayla Harrison, but that's just my take. Um, The other thing is, I got to ask you this, Jason. When you look at that UFC roster, how many more fighters on – how many fighters on that roster do you think are more valuable to a mixed martial arts promotion than Francis Ngannou? How many names are you going on before you get to Francis? If we're really looking at the landscape and and kind of putting um, into perspective how big of a signing this is, are there 10 people in the UFC roster? Are there five? I know for a fact John Jones and Connor are above him. Who else would you put above Francis in terms of value to an MA organization? So I will say this. My viewpoint, I think, is going to be different than a lot of people who are in this MMA podcast landscape because I do work for a restaurant group. You know, I I do handle marketing and we have shown UFC pay-per-views. So I kind of have an idea of what fighters have the ability to bring in an audience than your typical UFC pay-per-view. And I'll be, and I'm not trying to be a hater here or anything along those lines. I never viewed Ngannou as a guy who brought more people to the table. You know, like when you talk about, you know, the biggest UFC pay-per-view draws we have seen in this organization's history, you know, it, it starts to me with Conor McGregor. He's number one. Then it's almost like I think like a 2A, 2B situation of Ronda Rousey and Brock Lesnar for two different reasons because Ronda just brought a totally different audience to watch a UFC pay-per-view, just like Brock. Brock bringing the wrestling fan with him. And then to me, it's John Jones. And then after that, it's I think it's a big drop-off. You know, and, yeah. and so like I just like 
like one of my thoughts when I was thinking about looking at this deal where like, you know, man, Hey, great for Francis Ghana to get the bag and, and whoever he fights is going to get the bag as well. I, I look at it from the PFL's aspect and, and like me and you were talking about this yesterday. Like if you're the PFL, like how many paper use do you guys sell for this deal to make sense financially short term for you? It's got to be a lot. It's got to break records for a non UFC mixed martial arts pay-per-view is the number you need to get at. And it's got to be more than just a Francis fight. It's got to be Jake Paul's first ever mixed martial arts fight. And it's got to be an interesting opponent for Jake. And that's what they need to do to, to, to make a profit. It's certainly a possibility, but they are on an uphill battle. And that kind of impacts maybe some of the value that Francis got in his deal, right? The part ownership in the PFL isn't too valuable if the company isn't making a major profit or profit at all. That being said, I think the real value in Francis's deal is quite honestly the ability to go out and take the boxing matchup. I do believe the boxing matchup is going to give Francis the biggest payday in his career and a bigger payday than if he had fought John Jones. So that is what works out for Francis. But for the PFL, I would be highly, highly surprised if they made a profit on whatever pay-per-view they promote a Francis fight on because I think they're just asked the, the buy rate would have to be like 300, 400,000 buys, I think. And that just seems really unrealistic unless they put Jake Paul and a riveting mixed martial arts opponent on pay-per-view. You know, as I, you know, obviously well, time is going to tell what the PFL can put together. And the one benefit that they do have is that they know Ngannou is not going to fight until 2024, which to me is a, I'm to be honest with you, I think it's a little bit of concern. I, I really wonder where, where is the knee in terms of, you know, when you're talking about training for a mixed martial arts fight, but like, to me, like this is a message by the PFL to every heavyweight in the UFC. Hey, if you can get out of your deal. There's a bag waiting for you here, whether you not you want to take it. And but when I look at the top heavyweights in the UFC, no way they're going to be able to out of their contract before 2024 starts. John Jones, Surreal Gunn, Sergey Pavlovich, Steve Miocic, maybe Curtis Blades, maybe. I could see maybe they, they don't want to get in that business. And Asimov, he ain't going anywhere. Now we're starting to get into the Tata Tuavasa, which I would not think the UFC would want to get rid of, especially the deal they just did uh, with Australia. You got Alexander Volkov, Sergey Spivak, Jolton Almeida. We all know Jolton Almeida is going nowhere. Marcin Tabura. Derek Lewis, I think, is the interesting one. Yeah, I could see Derek Lewis for sure. But we've seen that fight. Oh, we've seen that fight once, and well, yeah, we're not going back and watching it. So is Stipe under a long term deal? I would imagine so, yeah. I, I would I would think that none of these guys have a realistic shot of becoming a free agent by the time. Francis is going to make his PFL debut. The other one may be Volkov, but I don't know. And, and again, when it comes to name value in terms of which fight would pop on pay-per-view, it's literally Surreal gone, Stipe, Jones, obviously, but that's not going to happen. But I don't know. Maybe Jones will happen. <laughs> you know, Jones, <laughs> Jones you? has never, has no. never seen... Did you see what? his comical tweet yesterday? What did he tweet? Quote, my man wins one Super Bowl, transferred to a top arena football league, and then claims to be better than Brady. That's what I'm hearing right now. I'm sorry. I saw that, and I just started laughing my ass off. Yeah, he did play to you. He did play. He got the Brady in, and he's right. I mean, Jones is the goat, but hey, Francis is the is a champion, and he hasn't lost, and he's got a claim to being the best heavyweight in the world. If these two fought, am I picking John Jones? You bet your bottom dollar. I think Jones brings him down and probably taps him out. That being said, Francis don't hit like a like a truck. He hits like a damn train. He's got some of the heaviest hands in the history of this sport, and. He showed a great ability to survive and persevere against Cyril Gunn. It'd be a tough fight for John Jones, who honestly, his his big issue is he's his own worst enemy. So there's no telling if these two matched up if Jones doesn't get in his own way and causes himself to lose that fight. 
But yes, Jones clearly would be the betting favorite, and Jones clearly is the best heavyweight in the world right now. Um, but kudos to Francis. When he went on the MMA Hour, whenever he became, um, you know, his deal with the UFC ran out, and he had all those demands that sounded kind of crazy. You listen to that. Jason, he got all of those demands in his PFL deal. Every single one. Yeah, look, he he got what he wanted. You know, um, the one thing, and, and I said this before he went on the MMA Hour, is being in this media game as long as I have, and you've been in this media game now for some time as well, when we're talking about multiple people and giving their version of the story, they're going to give the version of the story that makes them look the best. And it is our responsibility to sit back and evaluate what everyone has said. We all, you know, if you go back to when the UFC came out and said they were releasing Ngannou, they were giving the sto- the, the version of the story that they believe made them look the best and, you know, vice versa and, you know, down the line here. So <laughs> it's one of those things where, you know, sometimes I kind of take some things with a grain of salt here, but, you know, you listen to Ngannou talk, you know, I, I believe everything he has to say here, but the one thing that I did find very interesting and MMA Junkie has a piece on this where the headline of the story is lies, performance and professionalism. Francis Ngannou details BKFC, one FC and Bellator's pursuit of him. He calls Bellator very professional. Now, if you remember a couple weeks ago, Scott Coker let everyone know we're not getting into the Francis Ngannou business. And Francis Ngannou saying that, look, they never even made an offer. And my takeaway from that is Ngannou's people told Bellator what it was going to take, and they were like, yeah, we can't make money on this thing. We're we're not going there. One championship. Bro, this is too much. Uh, Ngannou goes, uh, he goes, says, he was like, oh, I can fly you to Singapore. I can fly you to Cameroon. I can do this. He was all in, Ngannou said. I'm like, bro, that's too much, and I cannot handle this. Uh, we all know Chartree. Uh, we all know what it's going for. But the funniest one is BKFC. This guy is just a joke. As Ngannou says, I just think he assumed that I'm so expensive. Obviously, because if he had to take a loan out of his house to put on a show, then I think he assumed the loan couldn't pay me. I never spoke to him. My team never spoke to him. And then when I saw his comments, I was like, where is this guy coming from? That's why I didn't even talk to him about it. I'm like, this guy is just a joke. So that really colors in that story, right? Remember when we originally talked about the comments from BKFC and yeah. – and made it seem like Francis gave him a number that was outrageous. But it's good to get the other side, and obviously. I would be surprised if there was not someone in Team Ngannou that threw out what they were looking for, and that was kind of the starting point of where these promoters, you know. Like, you know, look, if you're the PFL, they're getting in the pay-per-view business. Bellator is not in the pay-per-view business, so I don't – it would not make sense to – shell out the kind of money that Ngannou wanted if you think you can't make money on it. And, and that, to me, is – that would be the interesting part of this is if you're the PFL, i got to be thinking the PFL is looking at this from a long-term aspect. They're looking at what this could do for the promotion long-term because short-term, i got to think they're just going to lose a decent amount of money in promoting a Francis Ngannou fight. It's probably the same strategy that you saw out of streaming platforms when they first started going. Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, they spent a lot of money on getting content and making content to get people on their product. And look at what's happened recently. Cutting costs on production, being more selective on the content they make bringing up the prices of subscriptions. I feel like that's the strategy PFL is going with. And to be frank, that's probably the best way to go about making a mixed martial arts organization whenever the UFC already has so much oxygen. You got to you got to give up on making a profit for years to get people in the door and into your product. I, I got to tell you about a funny text message I got today from someone who used to be in the mixed martial arts industry. What's the feeling on Bellator right now? 
saw everything with Francis and PFL. Are they considered number two now, or is it still Bellator? And my response to him is something I, I've talked about here on the show, and I said, Bellator to me has got the number two roster in mixed martial arts. PFL has the number two television deal, and PFL clearly, I mean, look, and they, they've been doing this for years. This goes back to the World Series of Fighting. I mean, they're ready to throw some money in, into the pot and, and try to make this thing work. And it's going to be interesting to kind of see how the PFL can develop a roster because this could also be a, a very much, a, not, not just a sign to heavyweights, but every mixed martial arts fighter and say, look, we're, we're here to play, get, play ball. Do you want to have a conversation or not? And if you had to tell me which promotion would you bet will be in a better spot three years from now, I would bet on the PFL. I, I agree. I agree. I mean, because look, we, we all, we all know the rumors out there about Bellator. Um, you know, I, I've had some people very, um, not, not involved with Bellator kind of basically say, yeah, Bellator is not being sold to the BFL and it's going to be interesting to see where Bellator is six months from now, because they, there's still not a lot of buzz out there for the promotion. You know, I mean, they, they had a, a decent fight card this past weekend in Paris. You know, no, you know, I would consider a notable upset in the main event of Fabian Edwards going out there and being Gegar Mousasi. But I mean, let's just be honest about it. What I didn't see a lot, a lot of talk about it. You know, before the event and after the event. Yeah, right. You literally have what the third or fourth best fighter in the promotion's history getting upset by Fabian Edwards, and there's not that much buzz. You have a Solid matchup in the in the tournament between Primus and Barnawi, where Primus advances, and we've got a feel good story out of him. You got Goiti with a knockout, and and not a lot of buzz out of Bellator. Um, it, it's a shame, but do you think there's a possibility of the UFC buying Bellator? Would that only come happen if Bellator sells for a low price? You think? I just, I just don't think because of the antitrust lawsuit out there, I just don't think they would go that route. But boy, as a combat sports fan, would I love that shit? Yeah. What about one FC? Uh, unless one FC wants to make a big play into the United States market. I mean, I mean, like, look, I think as a combat sports fan, if the PFL and Bellator merged and it was run by Scott Coker, I think they could put a little bit of a dent in the market share the UFC has, you know, on the mixed martial arts community. I just don't know if Scott Coker would make the same decisions the PFL makes when it comes to signing Francis and Jake and and whatnot. I, but look, I think that's if you're the PFL, I think a lot of that's about the long term of trying to, you know, they they want to be a player in this game, and you know, like it's just when we sit here in January 2024. And we know who Francis Ngannou is making his PFL debut against. Are we going to be excited? I, I'm, All right, I don't bro, know. Bro, put it in the time capsule. Who's he going to fight? Who's he going to fight? My, my money would be on Fabricio Verdun. All right. I believe he will fight Maurice Green. All right, so... Michael I, Scott I get, uh, down on Twitter, put that, put that. Michael Scott, we need you to be our. Uh, who the hell's the dude who always posts aerial stuff? Jedi Goodman. We, Michael Scott, we need you to be our Jedi Goodman. We need you to clip <laughs> this and come back to us in 2024 and let us know who's right. Jason's got Verdum. I've got Maurice Green. The one thing I'm sure of is neither of those fights are selling over 150 thousand buys. I mean, look, I mean, if you're the PFL, you're going to have to load the deck. Yeah, I mean, that is, is Jake Paul's MMA debut on that pay-per-view. I would bet my uh, my left testicle on that. I believe that uh, Jake's fights will all be on pay-per-view and the schedule lines up. Yeah, I mean, I just. But it, it's kind of like that tweet I read at the beginning of the show from Chris. You know, we're all happy France got the bag, but. Is anyone sitting there all giddy about potential matchups PFL can make? Because right now, we don't know realistically what they can make. Well, dude, there's only one fight I want to see out of Francis. It ain't happened, bro. Joe, it's not happening. I know. It's not happening. I know, but that's that's the only one. Maybe like a rematch with Gone and then like Stipe. But 
Jones and Francis is the one fight I want to see, and maybe down the line against Tom Aspen on Sergey Pavlovich. But those are the fights I want to see. But Francis isn't getting any younger. When he fights, he'll be 38, I believe. Um, but you know what? Hopefully, the knee recovers fully. It, it may not. It, it's, as you, it, it's hard to anticipate that happening. But we'll see. Only time will tell. All I know is Francis has got a lot more money in his bank account, and I'm happy for him. Look, two years away from MMA competition. I, I don't know. I, you know, how well does that go? There's only a few people where that has gone well, right? One is named John Jones, and the other one is named George St. Pierre. That is list. about <laughs> That's about it. I mean, I may have forgot a couple others. But that's about it. Fedor, it took some time, but then he had some successes. But his quality of opponents are pretty poor when you look at his victories. Francis, at least, will probably have a poor quality of opponent as well. So he may have success. It's not like Connor, who's going to get thrown into the lion's den. And he may succeed against Michael Chandler because it's, it, the matchup lends itself to his boxing. But... For Francis, if you're in there with Fabricio Verdum after two and a half years off, that's almost like a night off. So, of course, as Francis makes his news, we all know that Dana White could not contain himself. He had to get his own news in there. And uh, I want to uh, point up a tweet. I want to, uh, I know I sent you earlier here today. And this came from Christian Printup. So for people who don't know, uh, Christian Printup was a executive with Bellator in the Bjorn era and then the start of the Scott Coker era. He's now running a, uh, entertainment for a casino up in upstate New York. And he goes, if anyone thinks the UFC announcing so many fights yesterday was not done intentionally to flood the media with news to Barry Francis signing with the PFL, does not understand the business of MMA. And that is absolutely true. But here's my thing about these fight announcements yesterday, Daniel. WTF. Why do we need a BMF title matchup? I don't know. It's stupid as hell. Like, it's it's stupid, whatever. I will say if there's two guys who deserve it, those are the two guys at 155 who deserve it. Poye and Gaethje. It's a great fight, but why, Jason? It's probably because when Dana White goes to bed at night, when Hunter Campbell goes to bed at night, when Ari Emanuel goes to bed at night, they whisper, we can't do a pay-per-view without a belt. We can't do a pay-per-view without a belt. And so that's why they need a shiny belt to put on the line. That being said, if there's two names that deserve being called BMFers, it's Poye and it's Gaethje. Yeah, I mean, like, love the fight. Love the fight. But why do we need a BMF belt? I mean, that's my thing about it. Why? Dude, I love the co-main event. Jan and and Alex Pereira? Dude. Dude. Yes. Yes, sir. I am hyped for that one. That's I'm a hype for UFC 291. That's one of those fights that you got to look at with with Alex. But, hey, you got to think that if he wins that one. That fast tracks him right to a title shot at, at two hundred immediately. Pounds. Um, immediately, immediately fights fights uh, Jamal Hill. Is Jamal is Jamal matched up already? Uh, they have not officially announced it, but it, it does kind of appear like his first title defense will be against Yuri. Okay, so then what the hell is Uncle Liev doing? I don't. I don't think he's exactly in the uh, Christmas card list of the UFC. <laughs> Really? After all the complaining after? Yeah. I, dude, mean, I think. Uh, how about Askarov getting Paulo Costa? Like, you want to talk about a fight that got booked out of nowhere? Which then once again leads to the bigger question of what the hell is going on with Hamza Chimaev? Dana, White did, an Dana White did an interview with Aaron Bronstetter, and Aaron kind of brought it up, and Dana kind of alluded to personal problems. Um, cause I, I want to say Aaron went down the line of questioning of, Hey, is there a reason he can't get into the United States? It's, it, it might have to do with his affiliation with people, right? Could be, the, very well, could be, yeah. That, but wasn't there some rumors going around that he might actually fight at one seventy? 
Or fight Yeah, Usman. I mean, it sounds like the people around him went in the fight at 185, but there's also people that fight at 170. Like, hey, like you look at the, the 291 fight card, of course, that'll be July 28th in Salt Lake City. Uh, I do the Stephen Thompson Michelle Pahea fight. That's another one that I, I like. Stylistically, that, that should be a fun matchup. Uh, Tony Ferguson, Bobby Green, that's that's got fun written all over it. Um, kind of surprised they kind of surprised they announced a Tony Ferguson fight. Yeah, I know, right? After I what happened last you. weekend with him? Oh yeah. Wait, what happened? Was it a DW? Was it a hit and run or did he? What uh, was D, it? D, DUI. Was did he hit anybody? I'm not sure. Or no. Let me I'm let me look sure. it up. So I, I completely forgot. And then also like Bobby Green was throwing a, a BF in his last fight whenever it got called no contest. Uh, DUI arrest. He was arrested after a rollover crash in LA. Um, so thank God he's all right. Obviously making the mistake to get under the wheel. Um, uh, dr- drunken driving. He was arrested on drunken driving. Yeah. Uh, his pickup truck flipped over and collided with multiple cars. Um, he, re- he refused to take a breathalyzer. So, yeah. Any lawyer will tell you, you never take the breathalyzer. I'm just saying that's something I've always heard been told. Um, by the way, if I told you a year ago, that Sean O'Malley be fighting for a UFC Bantamweight title in August of 2023. What would you have said to me? I mean, I, I don't know how shocked I would have been, Jason. Because, yes, Sean isn't your clear-cut top Bantamweight in the world. But his hands are really good. And I do know that the UFC was going to put him on the fast track for the championship. But the thing that really would have surprised me out of Sean is how well he performed against Peter Yan. That in and of itself was the big shocker. When I think of what I thought about Peter Yan mm-hmm. headed into yeah. that fight, and even though I had Peter winning that fight, Sean held his own and fought the guy who I thought was the second best bantamweight in the world close. Bro. If Sterling can take down Henry Cejudo, what do you think he's going to do with Sean O'Malley? Oh, I know. But the thing is, Sean like, can put him okay. out. If I'm over at bestfightodds.com, if I told you it has Aljamain Sterling in the future odds as only a minus 275 favorite, you would say. It's my, it's pretty surprising. I, I would, would I would have Sterling. thought... Minus 350. Yeah, because the pathway to victory is so clear. But, you know. Dude, think about this. Yair Rodriguez is a bigger underdog against Alexander Volkanovsky than Sean O'Malley is against Aljamain Sterling. You know, that's crazy. That really is. Because with Volk and Yair, Yair has more paths to victory there. You could, you could realistically see him getting that win with Sean. It's really just catching Aljo early. It's not on his back throwing up a triangle choke. And the the, the one thing is that Aljo's not very good at space with his takedown shots. So I don't think he's going to be able to bring down Sean out of space. I think he's going to have to clinch him up against the cage. So that is going to be the one thing. And, and I do think he'll take him down, and I do think he'll tap out O'Malley. But it's going to be harder than we imagined. Yeah, I mean, look, if he gets on the back of O'Malley, it's over. It's over. Yeah, so let's see what that long neck he's got. Yeah. Um, the, other, the other thing is Aljo always has injuries, so don't discount that. Like, that dude is always injured. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, by, yeah. uh, by the way, uh, in some uh, – just because I was – Kinds of I was getting over to uh, this UFC's uh, this weekend's UFC fight card. I uh, didn't you know see the the story about the PFL and the failed drug test they had. Uh, Bellator also had a failed drug test this week. Yancey Medeiros uh, tested positive for a banned substance at his fight there in Hawaii. Fight has been overturned to a no contest. Also, uh, Mike Mazzulli confirmed to me that Sydney Outlaw is no longer suspended as part of uh, the what was the 
the ways for him to get off suspension along with serving his time was to uh, submit a clean drug test. That, that did happen, so we'll see when Sydney Outlaw gets back in there. But, uh, you know, this week we got UFC fight night, Dern versus Hill. Of course, this fight was supposed to take place last week. It's moved here to the main event when this fight card lost its main event. Uh, your co-main event, Edmund Shabazian, taking on Anthony Hernandez. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I know I'm sure the Diego Feje and Michael Johnson fight is probably the you know one of the more interesting fights for you because of, of, of Diego being in there from the Rio Grande, but uh, you know, I would tell you this: outside of the main event, because the main event does have a, a, a lot of implications, the fight that I just like, I just look at from just a pure, I think it's going to be fun. Is Andre Fajillo and, and Joaquin Buckley these two guys? And and Buckley had a, a, a comment today talk about you know his his move back down to one seventy was because of fighting some of those big boys and the power they have. But like that to me is, is probably the fight outside of the main event that sticks out to me the most. I agree with you. That's a hell of a fight. I mean, I think outside the main event and the and the co-main because like Shabazzian always gets my interest, but. Uh, that's a bit. That's a that's a pretty good fight. The other one is uh, Lupi Godinez. Uh, really impressed me in her fight against Cynthia Calvillo last time out. Mm. So I, I'm enticed to see her fight. Uh, she's matched up with uh, Emily Dakota. Tay um, Mahashate is a dude I'm interested in. I always love the dudes with one name, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing him fight uh, his opponent. Um, God, I'm gonna give it a try. Vyacheslav Borshev. I don't think I did too bad. It, it, you just call I call him by his nickname, Slava Claus. That's a pretty good nickname. Not going to lie. I, I, I love that nickname. Uh, here's the moral of the story. This fight card sucks, but I got to give <laughs> I got to give credit. I, it, it, it pays me to say this because I have not one but two real Grand Valley homeboys. On the card, Gilbert Urbina, who was on the Ultimate Fighter and lost to Brian Battle, who had a badass knockout this past week. He is from the city of Westaco, Texas. His nickname is the RGV Bad Boy. So you better believe I'm going to have on my Gilbert Urbina fighter kit, and I'm going to root for him when he takes on Orion. On the prelim. So I'll be rooting for him. I'll be rooting for Diego Ferreira, who is from Brazil, but he has a gym here in the Valley. And and this fight against Michael Johnson is pretty good. But, yeah, Jason, going to be honest with you, this card sucks. It, it is. It, well, first off, you, when you look at the fight card, you know it's a UFC Apex card. You, you clearly know that. But it's, it, it's not a card on paper that you get excited for. It, it's not a fight card that makes you go, I got to be at home on – on Saturday afternoon, early Saturday evening, I, I will not be home on uh, on Saturday evening. So this will be a fight card I'll be checking out after the fact, uh, which seems to happen more more times than not at this point in my life. Uh, especially these fight night cards, I I truly just find myself just going back well, after the fact. Let's make it interesting for the people. Who's the pick? Angela Hill, Mackenzie Dern. Dern's a small favorite against Angela Hill. Who's your pick? Mackenzie Dern. I like Angela Hill to win this fight. I like Angela I, Hill. I think. I think the longer the fight goes, I think there is a a very much of a favor for Angela Hill. I mean, I just think it's if Dern gets this one to the ground. I mean, we we all know her jujitsu abilities and what she can do. I mean, I will tell you this: when I was looking at some of the betting odds on this one, I thought some of the odds were kind of interesting. Shabazzian is a plus one seventy betting underdog. I was like, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, Andre Fialho is a plus 190 dog against Joaquin Buckley. I thought was kind of interesting. Um, a little surprised Diego Fajal is maybe not a little bit bigger of a favorite against Michael Johnson. He's only a, a minus 150 uh, betting favorite. Um, outside of that, not a ton that stuck out with you on the betting side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not very interesting. Um, I, I got to say, you know, that ABC card last Saturday, that was good stuff, man. Like, Jelton Almeida, I'm excited to see his career, man. I think he's going to be an interesting heavyweight challenger, and uh, the health of the heavyweight division is is really strong in the UFC. You now have him and Aspinall and Pavlovich as three fresh faces 
And, and it makes you think, yeah, maybe Curtis Blades' days are numbered because you don't want Curtis to come out here and kind of stop the momentum that these three guys have. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I thought the interesting thing that Dana said after the event was over, he was talking about these ABC fight cards, and he was like, they really want to use these cards as a way to develop, you know, these younger fighters. So, you know, look at someone like, you know, to me, Jolton Almeida and, and Ian Gary, to me, are, are the two fighters on this card that you really stick out. And, you know, and I, I saw this thing on Facebook earlier this week, and I'm pretty sure I saw it to you. I sent it to you, and it, and it was, who would you buy more stock in right now? Jolton Almeida or Ian Gary. And I think it's a fabulous debate. I probably go Jolton Almeida just because it's it's heavyweight MMA. But if you picked Ian Gary, I would have no problem with that. Yeah, I mean, Ian looks really good against Daniel Rodriguez, and I would say it's probably one of his best performances yet. Given that I picked Daniel Rodriguez to upset Ian Gary, I'm going to go with Jalton Almeida. I think with Ian Gary, he's shown more holes throughout his career. That being said, the man is still undefeated, and he is showing improvement fight to fight. Ian Gary has more potential as a superstar because he has a better personality for the American audience. He really, really comes off as like a, as like a, a child of Conor McGregor. And he works out well in those post-fight interviews. So he has more potential as a draw. But in terms of in the cage, I mean, Jalton's already making short work and embarrassing Jaizuno Rosenstrike, right? Taking him down and Jair is looking at his corner for advice as if they're at the – as if they are like a player on a video game and they have the controllers that are yeah. going to move his body. I mean, Jalton embarrassed a top 10 heavyweight. <laughs> So I'm buying I'm buying Jalatin stock. Um, yeah, sorry. By the way, I got to give kudos to who I don't know who the reporter was, but as I'm watching this Dana White uh, press press conference, and this reporter is asking about Brian Battle, what he did, he go out there in 14 seconds, and uh, Dana goes, you know what? I'm gonna give him a fifty thousand dollar bonus too. Hell yeah! I mean, like you know, hopefully that reporter got a little piece from Brian Battle. I know, right? I know. I mean, That's throw like a awesome. hundred bucks or something. Like, hey, man, appreciate it, man. Yeah, that was a great knockout. I mean, Gabriel Green came in, threw all those strikes, and Brian off his back foot caught him. But overall, it was a fun card, right? Even a guy like Alex Morono, who didn't have a bonus, had a really fun fight against Tim Means. The way he locked on that guillotine after throwing the back fist was really good. But you look at Carlos Yulberg, you look at Matt Brown and Court McGee. It was a fun fight card, and, you know, one of the fights that wasn't that fun, but it's worth talking about, is Johnny Walker and Anthony Smith. And I just want to give kudos for Johnny Walker. This is a guy who lost four out of five fights, Uh thought the career might be over. He has turned things around, three wins in a row, going up against a top-light heavyweight in Anthony Smith, and Johnny really doesn't make too many mistakes and wins a cautious decision destroying the legs of Anthony Smith. Yes, this wasn't a win that pole vaulted him to a fight against Jamal Hill, but shout out to Johnny Walker, who has righted the ship of his MMA career. Yeah, you look at these three wins. First round win against Ian Kuzalaba. First round win against Paul Craig. Third round win against Anthony Smith. Uh, Dana White obviously was not very thrilled with performance. Who knows? Maybe Johnny Walker gets uh, Ink Live next. Yeah, I think that might make a lot of sense, actually. I, I think that's the next fight for both those guys, and uh, I would watch it. I'm excited for that fight. Let me just, I just, I'm just going to pull up the UFC light heavyweight rankings. Let me see where. So Johnny Walker is currently fifth. Ankalaev is currently second. Well, number one's Yuri or what? Yuri, Ankalaev, yeah. uh, who's three? Polhovich, uh, four, Rakic. Five, uh, Krylov and Walker are tied for fifth. Anthony Smith seven, Ozmer eight, Paul Craig ninth. Who is uh, Paul Craig's actually moving down to 185 pounds? He's going to take on Andre Muniz uh, at a the next couple months. That, that fight card, that fight just got announced the other day. Uh, Ryan Span number ten. And I think obviously it's fair to put Alex Pereira in that top five. So I think he's that's where he is in those rankings whenever he does fight. So you know. It's an interesting division in the top half of it for sure. There is a drop off after about six, but uh, yeah, it, it's sunny days at two o five. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, always, I always love going to the MMA Reddit just to see what, what's on there. Yeah. PFL really Lightweight uh, Champion Rob Wilkinson wants to fight with Francis Ngannou. Of course he does. Who in the PFL would not want that fight? You could be you could be a 55er. You oh. should just change his what? You know what the PFL should do. I, I, I just figured it out. I know who they should have him fight. He, who? He, he might have to put on a little weight to make heavyweight. Jake Paul? Yeah. Oh my god. You're ridiculous. You know what? You're ridiculous. That is crazy. I, I, I let him fight Logan. I don't know. <laughs> maybe he should do. Uh, maybe he should do an MMA fight with a boxer like um, Deontay Wilder or something. But uh, yeah, ooh, UFC 293 in Australia. Yeah, the, the was- press the press release today was. Ba- I mean, when you read it, it was yeah. The UFC did deal with the Australian government. Yeah. I mean that that was very evident when you when you read it. I mean, uh, I, the press release says UFC lands knockout deal to bring blockbuster bouts to Sydney, and then it says UFC is set to return to Sydney for the first time since 2017 after securing a four year multi event agreement with the New South Wales government, aka they got a big site fee. They got the bag. That, I they mean, got the bag. And that that's what that's the UFC's business model at this point. Yeah. Yeah. They uh the UFC is really good at making money. They are really good at turning a profit. You gotta say, you know. Yeah. By by the way, I don't know if you notice this, there's no UFC event next week. What are we gonna do next week? Well, that's Memorial Day weekend, so you know. Barbecue, some have some cocktails. I've been known to do that. We got to come up with some some fun ideas for that week. Some fun topics. Oh, we already. Oh, oh, you've already thrown one out. Oh, we haven't, yeah, talk, we haven't talked about it on the pod. I yeah, guess we. Can, I yeah. guess we can throw the teaser out here as we start to kind of wrap the show up. Yeah. Predictions for the yeah. main event of UFC three hundred. Yeah, yeah, and we got we got to have a place maybe like a Google Doc where we can put our predictions in just so. We could see if we were right about anything, which we probably weren't. The one thing I want to be right about UFC 300, Jim Miller's got to kick off that pay-per-view. You know why, right? Was he on UFC 100? He was on UFC 100. Was that UFC 200? 200? He's got, he's got like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe him and Matt Brown, just OGs of the sport. Just hang around to get to the UFC 300. Okay, without looking, do you think there was any other fighter on UFC 100 that is still on the roster today? John Jones. Other than Jim. Oh, you you called it, huh? John Jones. I, I already know he was on it. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, and I'm looking right and he now. Was suppo- and he was supposed to be at UFC 200. Don Keon Kim is not still in the UFC, is he? I don't think so. Yeah, he hasn't fought since 2017. Yeah, it's literally just John Jones and uh, and uh, wait, oh yeah, and Jim Miller. I was gonna say I couldn't find Jim Miller, but yeah, just just John Jones and Jim Miller. That's it. Wow, that's so crazy. Uh, maybe another like maybe we'll do a agree disagree next week. Get some listener reaction on this one. Viacom owns 100 percent of Bellator 12 months from now. Oh yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I I I dig that one. My guess would be the answer is no, but how many fighters do you think on UFC 200 are still in the UFC roster right now? Over under, give me give me a number. I'm trying to think who was on the card. So I know we had DC and Anderson Silva. So neither one of those are in the UFC. Well. They're no longer active fighters in the UFC. Obviously, Cormier is a broadcaster. Amanda Nunez was on that card. She was in the main event. She's the only active fighter on the main card that's still in the UFC. That's crazy. Who else is yeah. on the main card? Kane and Brown. Okay. Edgar and Aldo. DC and Silva. Hunt and Lesnar. Tate and Nunez. Um, Pena fought Zingano, so Pena's still in the UFC. Kelvin Gaslam still in the UFC, right? He took on Johnny Correct. Hendricks. He's going to 170. Uh, TJ Dillashaw is Rafael Sunset still in the UFC? I b- believe he still is. 
Uh, so Sage Northcutt fought Enrique Marin, Joe Lozon and Diego Sanchez, Gegard Mousasi and Tiago Santos, Jim Miller and Gomi. So I think you got Miller, Lozon, Gastelum, Asuncao, Pena, Nunez. So what, that six fighters that are still on the UFC roster? This uh, UFC 200 happened in 2016. Wow. 2016 was a long time ago. Yeah, man. Jim Miller fought Takanori Gomi. It's it's crazy. Jim Miller's still doing this thing in 2023. <laughs> I know, man. I love it, though. But again, yeah, you know, I can't even remember who he said was the longest tenured uh, UFC fighter. But uh, it wasn't Arlovsky, right? N- no, because Arlovsky had that gap. Was it? I think it might have been Joe Lozon, but maybe it wasn't. Yeah, Joe was the other name that kind of popped in my head. Yeah, yeah. We literally talked about this like not that long ago, whenever Ed Herman retired. Uh, but I'll just I'll, I'll just double check for us because uh, there was that great MMA junkie article. Oh my god! And it crashed. We'll just assume it's Joe Lozon. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, yeah. We didn't, we, we, yeah. we didn't talk much about Bellator. Um, they had their event in Paris. Uh, uh, Baby lost. getting that win against Musasi. That fight sucked, <laughs> and they already. <laughs> It's like Bellator had this planned out. Hey, Johnny, we need you to come to uh, Paris, and uh, yeah, we got to announce your next fight in Dublin. Yeah, and they they got into it, man. They got into it. Him and uh, him and Fabian inside the cage. Douglas Lima got his got his uh, 185 pound win, and uh, I was watching an interview he did before that fight with uh, MMA Junkie with uh, uh, George and Goes, and he did it. He did totally slam the door on 170, but that door is about an inch away from closing. Yeah, it makes he, sense. I mean, he basically made the point of, yeah, I don't think my body can make 170 anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's rare you see fighters get into their 30s, move up in weight, and then move back down. I mean, that. The only people who do who move down to that age are like freaking Frankie Edgar and Jose Aldo. By the way, you know what happened today, nine years ago? Um, I have no idea what happened. The inaugural Bellator pay per view. Who was that? Was that a uh, Rampage and uh, Rampage Tito? and King Mo Chandler and Brooks? You remember it was supposed to be Chandler and Alvarez. And then they had to make the change a week before the fight. Yeah, F- Facebook memories reminded me that uh, that was nine years ago. I was like, "Jesus, that has been nine years." Was that the one in Memphis? It was outside of Memphis, <laughs> but it was uh, mark yeah. it was marketed as being in Memphis, but it was actually in South Haven, Mississippi, which was like fifteen minute drive from Memphis. Uh, good times, good times. I- I'll never, I'll never forget about being. Um, in that event so it was like friday night after the weigh-ins we go down to beale street so beale street's like their bourbon street you know the party district and you literally had to go through security to get in the beale street i was like i don't know if this is a good place to be <laughs> if i had to go through security just to get into the bar district well don't tell john moran oof, 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 oof. Don't tell John Murray. Yeah, yeah, that that is uh, that's not good. But I, I, I will tell you that I remember one thing about that night in Memphis is I ran into Douglas Lima, and and he was at this point I want to say he had just had knee surgery or or some type of surgery, and uh, I'm standing next to him talking to him. And I'm like, how the hell does this guy make 170? Yeah. And it comes full circle. It comes full circle. Here he is at 185, always a huge frame. And, yeah, I think uh, we'll never see him fight at Walter Wade again, especially because he looks so good against Van Stevens. Yeah, that was, I will tell you, like one of my biggest takeaways from that week was, you know, because that was Tito and Shomenko. And that was like the moment. Where I remember when Tito walked out for that fight, I was like, holy crap. Fans still love Tito. And But I remember – when we did the um, the media day, and we're talking to Shomenko, and Tito walks by, and I was like, "Holy crap! These dudes are separated by three weight classes." I, I, I wow. called a buddy up and I said, 
I was like, if you were going to Vegas this weekend, I'd just put money on Tino. He's that. He's that. Yeah. Remember when everyone thought that fight was fake? Oh, yeah. 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 I do. When yeah. you saw them standing next to each other, like, and Shalmanko was never a big um, 85 or at all. He was, you know, probably if he cut the weight, he would make 70 easy. But when they're walking around, I'm like, oh, my God. These guys are, they look like they're three weight class separated. Do you remember who Tito's last MMA fight was against? Chuck Liddell, right? No. Or is it Alberto Del Rio? <laughs> Alberto Del freaking Rio. Jesus Christ. I know. I know. Sometimes the, it's... <laughs> these things happen in MMA. <laughs> yeah, you could say that about like 47 things that happened in Tito's career. In, uh, Did I feel like I saw something about him trying to do another fight? Was he fighting the taxpayers of uh, of uh, Huntington Beach, or was he I just taking I away their money? Ta- I, don't, I think for some reason I thought he left California. I think it's probably because they were after him for fucking like, stealing money. <laughs> I, I feel like he either moved to Florida or he moved to Texas. Which is kind of makes the sense. Thing. Yeah, it's kind of the popular thing to do. Audi Builder Big Boy says he'll retire Tito Ortiz in boxing fight. This is in January. Tito Ortiz calls for one last fight in UFC against Shogun Hua. <laughs> uh, it never, it never ends. Away. It never ends. No, at some point it will, but it never ends. Yeah. That's why you never believe that R word in MMA. No, sir. No, sir. Few people truly retired. The one guy who retired was like Lee Murray, but that's because he went to jail. I mean, Habib is, seems to be sticking to it. Oh, I bet he comes back. I bet he comes back for sure. When fighting but does, is. But does it, does it take. Mahachev losing the belt for that to happen. No, I don't think so. I think it, it's it's a it's a personal thing. When you are a great fighter and you still want like that's what you do. Mm-hmm. That is what you do. And you that adrenaline rush, there's nothing like it in this world. Dude, right? I've asked nothing like that. I've asked so many fighters about that. And a lot of them say it is so hard to explain. And like, I, I think about the interview I had with Zach Cummings a couple weeks ago where, you know, he's like, I'm never going to be able to go out like that. But he's also, you can hear it in his voice. He's also like, man, I love this. I love yeah. this. Yeah. You know, they have it, to. It, 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 like I always related to like when you play golf. You, you, you like from like whole like 13 to 17 you're just hating the game of golf and then whole 18 about that that second shot you had the best shot of your life and you're like it gets you right back in yeah it's probably the same thing it, it's probably that is what a fight camp is the fight camp you hate and then when you do the fight and you just you're right back into it yeah no who who loves practice I'm talking about practice Not- man yeah, not not Allen Iverson, not Joel MB, not James Harden. Don't worry, you know, you, you might have to re-root for James Harden next year. Uh, uh, I'll take it, whatever. <laughs> I'll take it. How about how about this? Yeah. He goes he goes back to a Houston. We're opening up a strip club in Houston. I'm down. That's how you know we're gonna make the big bucks. <laughs> well, yeah, we gotta, be, gotta become the James Harden preferred strip club spot. James Harden is the only athlete. In 2023, that people associate with strip clubs. Yeah. No one else is like. I mean, maybe John Morant. He did have the you know the picture of him with all the dollar bills, but like as soon as the Sixers lost, you knew every other person with an NBA podcast is going to be like, "I heard James at the strip club," you know. After the no, loss, no, 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 no. That that's where like, you know, like whether you're like Bill Simmons. Zach Lowe, um, any popular NBA reporter has a popular podcast. How, like, 
if Harden's people came to you and said, hey, he'll come on your podcast, but you got to come to this strip club, how do you not hop on that opportunity? I know Stephen A. Smith's probably already there. Dude, dude. How fascinating of a conversation would that be with James Harden at the strip club? I would love to listen to hear him and Blue Rain, you know, together or whoever is, is the dancer of the night. Scarlet. Mercedes. Scarlet Powder. Mercedes. Tesla. You know, I want to go to an environmental strip club and be named Tesla. I don't know. What, what, what part of what, what always gets me funny at, at, at strip clubs, every strip club DJ has like the same voice. Yeah, I've never been to a strip club and probably never will. Oh, uh, come on. You got you got experience at least once. No, my girlfriend's not a big fan of it, of the idea. So I guess I got to listen to it. She's, she's already laid that one down for you. Yeah, even though she went to Thunder from Down Under on a Bachelorette trip, but whatever. I already watched dudes in underwear touch each other, but that's just professional wrestling. <laughs> in fact, I do it. I'm gonna. I gotta start shaving. I wrestle this weekend. I I heard a, <laughs> I heard a line the other day. It's, it goes, "You never know what's gonna happen when men in their underwear and they go into a cage and fight." <laughs> you could just end it at men in their underwear. Never know what's going to happen. You got two men in the underwear. <laughs> Go a lot see, of different see, ways. Now, old you know, people who watch the sport for a long time will remember the Dennis Hallman moment when he went out there in a straight up speedos. Yeah, wasn't that like UFC like a hundred and something? His ball did his balls come out? Don't believe so. I just I just remember Data White after it saying, "Get that off the television." <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! I'm just looking at the pictures now. Oh god, that's hilarious. His uh, the, it's a speedo, and on the spe- it's UC40, and uh, he has training mask sponsored him. Yeah, this the training mask was a huge. They were a huge MMA sponsor back in the day. Yeah, well, they had a huge, uh, huge front. Uh, sponsorship on Dennis Holman. Yeah, th- those days of huge MMA sponsorships have uh, gone out the window. Well, well, I don't know. Back the, UFC the, canvas, the UFC canvas does look like a NASCAR, so. Yeah, that's the one place it remains. Dude, every time I watch a UFC pay review, I just I look at that canvas and I go, holy cow, there is no available real estate. That's what you think. They're probably going to sell an advertisement on top of an advertisement. Yeah, but God forbid fighters have sponsors. God forbid. Yeah, you got to go to the PFL to get that piece of business done. I mean, just, I mean, I, but you know what? Sometimes I watch Bellator fights where fighters can have as many sponsors as they want, and you don't really see a ton. Now, how much of that is maybe in relation to where Bellator fights are at? I think that's a big part. I think these companies just don't believe that the investment is there, that the return on investment on a sponsorship is there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think unless that that fighter has a huge social media following, you probably you probably get more bang for your buck of them doing some shout out to you on their on their Instagram account than anything else. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. I mean, there's just more eyeballs there, and it and it's more permanent. Yeah, I know. But uh, we do appreciate everyone tuning in for this episode of the podcast. Of course, our new episodes come out every middle of the week for you, typically on Wednesdays, but sometimes maybe either earlier or later in the week. So we appreciate everyone tuning in for this episode of the podcast. And we'll be back here next week to discuss everything going on in the world of mixed martial arts.